Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's great to see such a full turnout. I'm not surprised because we have an incredible panel tonight to discuss this really important and very current issue. My name is Afwa Hirsch. I'm the social affairs editor at Sky News, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this event. Before we start, a plea, please, to turn off mobile phones. Um, well, put them on silent because we're quite happy for you to tweet, obviously. And we're filming as well, so um, there will be people joining us online, tweeting with the hashtag RSA Evicted. So anyone watching and everyone in the audience, please do get involved on Twitter. So as that hashtag suggests, we are here to discuss one of the defining social issues of our time, which is the lack of affordable housing and the crisis in social justice that arises from the poverty trap of people in poor quality, unstable accommodation, and as the name of the book we're discussing tonight suggests, frequently being evicted. And this book demonstrates that crisis in an incredibly compelling way. Um, and Matthew Desmond, who we're delighted to join, to welcome, is sitting beside me, and he will be speaking tonight about his book. He is a social scientist and ethnographer, co-director of the Justice and Poverty Project at Harvard University, and a 2015 MacArthur Genius Award winner. In Evicted, he offers us a searing portrait of USA Today, where fewer and fewer people can afford a roof over their head, and especially a stable one. Um, so he's going to share some of his thoughts on the book with us and the devastating impact that evictions have had on the lives of the urban poor in Milwaukee in America. We'll also be joined by Campbell Robb, who's sitting to my far left, who's the chief executive of housing and homelessness charity Shelter, and by Owen Jones here in the middle, who I'm sure you'll recognize from The Guardian, one of our most influential and socially engaged writers. So we will start with you, Matthew, and let's start by giving people a flavor of your work and the critical importance of this issue. Um, in the book, you talk about how housing, the, the emotional and social role it occupies in people's lives. You say, in languages spoken all over the world, the word for home encompasses not just shelter, but warmth, safety, family, the womb. It remains the primary basis of life. And you also say, life and home are so intertwined, it's impossible to think of one without the other. A stable home allows us to strive for self-reliance and personal expression, to seek gainful employment and enjoy individual freedoms. And how much happiness has been lost, how many capabilities snuffed out by the swell of poverty and our collective decision not to provide all our citizens a stable and decent place to live. Decent, affordable housing should be a basic right for everybody in this country. The reason is simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So how did we get to a situation where in 2016 so many millions of Americans are being denied this most basic right? Yeah, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be on the panel. And thanks so much for coming out. So over the last 10 years, we've seen incomes at the bottom of the distribution really be very stagnant. You know, poor families have watched their incomes basically be flatlined over the last 10 years or even fall. But at that same time, housing costs have soared. Between 1995 and today, the median rent in the United States has increased by over 70%. Utilities have skyrocketed too. And during the years where more and more low-income families were in need of more assistance, fewer and fewer were receiving it. So I think most Americans think that the typical low-income family lives in public housing or benefits from government assistance for housing, but the opposite is true. Only about one in four families that qualify for any kind of assistance receive it with respect to housing, which would be unthinkable with other basic needs like food. Uh, and in some of our largest cities, the waiting list for public housing isn't counted in years, it's counted in decades. So if you're like a single parent and you apply for public housing in Washington, D.C., you might be a grandparent by the time your application is renewed. And those three factors, stagnant incomes, rising housing costs, and the failure of the federal government to bridge the gap has created a situation where eviction, which used to be rare in America and draw crowds, has become, frankly, commonplace in some of our poorest areas. So let's talk about eviction, because that is the central theme of the book, really, and it draws together all of the different kind of crises in housing. I just want to read another quote 
um, from your book. A single eviction could destabilize multiple city blocks, not only the block from which a family was evicted, but also the block to which it begrudgingly relocated. In this way, displacement continued directly to what is called perpetual slums, churning environments with high rates of turnover and even higher rates of resentment and disinvestment. Right. So you present eviction as both symptom and cause, really, of the kind of social decay that you portray in, in, in a city Milwaukee. Yeah, I think that's right. And when you look at eviction, it causes loss. You know, you, not, you lose not only your home, but your community, your kids lose their schools. You often lose all your possessions, which are either just piled on the sidewalk or taken by movers. And if you're a homeless family, often you can't keep up with the payments and your stuff gets just, just thrown in the dump. Uh, workers lose their jobs, and anyone that has been evicted knows why. It's such a stressful, consuming event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work and eventually lose your foothold in the labor market. Eviction comes with a record, just like a criminal record, and that follows you around, and a lot of landlords turn you away if you've been evicted recently. So we know that evicted families move into even worse housing and worse neighborhoods. And then there's the effect that eviction has on your soul. You know, there's a moment in the book where Arlene, one of the folks that I follow in the book, says, you know, just my soul is messed up. And we know from studies that mothers who are evicted have higher rates of depression years later. It's a sticky thing. It stays with you. And when you add all that up, I think you have to conclude that eviction is a cause, not just a condition of poverty. And it's a cause of poverty and destabilization for whole neighborhoods, too. So, you know, it takes a lot of time to establish a community uh, and eviction can erase all that, can destroy all that. And so eviction can only if not only affect you and your children, but also your neighbors and the community from which you've left. So you mentioned Arlene. Tell yeah. us a little bit about some of the characters in the book, because you, you follow these characters in, in such detail that it really allows the reader to understand the emotional trauma that they go through, through this kind of cycle of eviction and poverty. Can you just give us some um, examples of the characters that you have portrayed here? Yeah, so Arlene, when I met Arlene, she was a single mom uh, trying to raise two boys in inner city Milwaukee. Uh, she was living in a very rundown apartment in a very poor neighborhood in the fourth poor city in the country, and that apartment took 88% of her income. And so there was no extra money for anything, you know, no extra money for clothes or toys for her boys. Uh, oftentimes she had to sell food stamps to make rent and the family would kind of go hungry. And you saw that under those conditions, eviction isn't necessarily the result of uh, irresponsibility, it's more inevitable. And so you see uh, Arlene get evicted because one of her boys hits a car with a snowball and the guy jumps out of the car and kicks the door and the landlord evicts her for damaging property. You see Arlene get evicted again when um, she calls uh, 911 because her youngest son is having an asthma attack and the landlord kind of puts her on notice and then something else kind of pushes over the edge. So there's such a tenuous grasp on housing and you see her kind of get tossed from one neighborhood to the next and you see the effect that has on her life and her children's life. And it's tough and it's heartbreaking. But eviction's also filled with other scenes and you see Arlene you see her be funny and you see her be courageous and you see her be spunky in the face of adversity. I always love telling this one story in the book about Crystal and Vanetta, who are these two other women that I met. And they met at a homeless shelter and, um, and they were looking for housing together. And this one day they were at McDonald's and this, uh, this young boy walks in and he was maybe nine or 10 and he didn't go up to the counter to order. He went around to the tables looking for scraps. He was hungry. And Crystal noticed him and she turned to Vanetta and said, you know, uh, what you got? And these two women who were homeless, you know, pulled their change, bought this boy lunch and sent him on his way. And Evicted is full of those scenes too, because I think each one of them reminded me how gracefully and powerfully uh, people refuse to be reduced to their, their hardships. And it's not just the people on the receiving end of evictions and poor quality housing. You also follow Sharina, who yeah. is this kind of slum landlord character who I found you portrayed in a really nuanced way because yeah. on the one hand, she's the bad guy. She goes on holiday to Jamaica and charters a glass bottom boat on the proceeds of these really low income people. But on the other hand, she's providing housing in a place that other landlords wouldn't go near. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about her and about the people who profit out of this, yeah. this scenario. Yeah, it's complicated. And I feel like that reaction to the book, I feel like, okay, I did my job okay. Because I think we let ourselves off the hook if we say, oh, these tenants, they're just irresponsible. Or, oh, these landlords are just greedy. 
I think when you look the problem in the face, it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, you see it turn Sharina, buy families groceries, let families slide on the rent, but you also see her evict a family because they reported housing problems, and you see her profit margins too. That was a big question I had when I started this. Like, why would you, why would you buy and rent property in some of the poorest neighborhoods of the city? Like, why would you do that? When I finished the book, I was like, why wouldn't you do that? You know, the profit margins are, are there. So Sharina made in a typical month after expenses what most of her tenants took home in a year. Uh, uh, about $10,000. About $10,000. $10, she owned 36 units. All of them were in inner city Milwaukee. Uh, I would say all of her tenants live below the poverty line. And, so I, and in assets, she's worth several million dollars. Yeah, that's what she estimated, yeah. But she always said, like, you know, you're kind of not in it for the future, you're in it for the now, you're in it for the cash flow. And so she didn't have a problem running some of her assets into the ground as long as they cash, cash flowed okay with her. But she's also a black woman from mm -hmm. the inner city who was kind of aspirational yeah, in yeah. the way she approached her business. Yeah, she, she's not the 1%. You know, she's not, she's not the 10%, you know, and she's kind of sees herself as a charitable businesswoman. She's very proud of what she built. Uh, she, she sleeps really well at night. And she'd say, you know, she's providing housing to folks that a lot of people uh, would turn away. And she's right. She's right. One of the things that struck me about the book, obviously your grasp of policy and is, if, any, if this country is anything to go by, an incredibly complicated and sometimes uh, opaque area to really understand yeah. the array of housing policies and benefits. It's partly because of the housing vouchers and the system of, of state assistance that landlords like her are able to make such generous profit margins. Tell us about the, the picture of what's going on in, in policy in America that, that you're conveying in the book. Yeah, I, so I think the big, the big picture is just like the waiting list. That's the big picture. So one day Arlene stopped by the housing authority and asked about the list for rent assistance. And she was told, you know, the, rent, the list is frozen because on it were 3,500 families that would have applied for the benefit, you know, four years ago. So if Arlene wanted a housing voucher, if Arlene wanted something that would allow her to spend only 30% of her income on housing, not 80%, she would have to wait, you know, about five years to the list unfroze, then like another few years until she made, her name made it to the top of the pile. And then she would just have to pray you know, that the person reviewing her file would ignore all the evictions she'd collected while trying to make ends meet on the, in the private market on a welfare check. I think that, so, I mean, I think that's the bigger question. That's the bigger story of America. Are we going to decide that housing is a, is a basic right? And if we do, how are we going to deliver on that obligation? Because our wealthy nation certainly can. I want to ask you about how we got to this state of affairs, because yeah. uh, Milwaukee is an interesting example because I mean, you, in the book you give the figure that in 1980 the black poverty rate was 28% and in 1990 it was 42%. Yeah. There's a, a strong element of race in the book. Even there's poor white areas and there's poor yeah. black areas and there's poor Latino areas. Yeah. It's also a story of industrial decline yeah. which is matched almost mirrored by the rise in poverty. And then there is the subprime crisis which has affected poor people, ethnic minority people disproportionately. <laughs> How long did it take to get to this stage? And what to you are the, are the causes that we need to be more aware of? Yeah, it, it, took, uh, it took drastically not long. <laughs> and uh, so deindustrialization uh, hurt a lot of the Rust Belt in America, the middle of the country, devastated Milwaukee. Between 1979 and 1983, Milwaukee lost about 53,000 jobs. That's more than it lost during the Great Depression. And the city's never recovered from that. So if, anyone, if, you, if anyone's been to Milwaukee, you just see all these shuttered factories all around the city. That had an enormous effect on the city as a whole, but it especially affected the African-American community. The majority of men employed in the African-American community during deindustrialization were in manufacturing. And so it left a lot of joblessness in the inner city. And then you had welfare reform come in the mid-90s. And you had a lot of moms, especially single moms, pushed into low-wage uh, labor markets. And that has largely been celebrated as a success. Uh, people thought the child poverty rate would explode after that, and it didn't. And kind of people held their breath and said, oh, it's not as bad as we thought. I think this book is an indictment on that story. And I think this book requires us to return to um, the absolute desperation of a lot of, a lot of folks living below the poverty line. In the face of America's eviction epidemic is moms with kids. 
It's moms with kids. Until very recently, the South Bronx in New York City had a daycare in its housing court because there were just so many kids coming through its door. And I think that you know, deindustrialization on the one hand, welfare reform, and just the rising housing costs without any sort of government extension um, are three big stories that got us to this place. It's also a situation where crime and poverty go hand in hand, isn't it? I just want to read another quote from the book. Um, Screening practices that ban criminality and poverty in the same stroke drew poor families shoulder to shoulder with drug dealers, sex offenders, and other lawbreakers in places with lenient requirements. Neighborhoods marred by high poverty and crime were that way not only because poverty could incite crime and crime could invite poverty, but also because the techniques landlords used to keep illegal and destructive activity out of rental property kept poverty out as well. So you have this situation where the very poor and the criminal are pushed together in a kind of endless cycle. Is that something that is replicated throughout America and how much of it, how much, how relevant is that to the, the, the stories of these families? I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty darn relevant, you know, and you see our lean move into a, an apartment that's just teeming with drug dealers. And she was able to move in because the landlord kind of ignored her eviction record and ignored the fact that she'd have to spend, you know, almost everything she had on the rent, but that exposed her boys to this criminal element. And she was terrified. She was, she had a 14 year old at the time who had this beautiful smile and was goofy and would talk to anyone. And so she, she left as soon as she could. And we know from statistical data that evicted families move from neighborhoods with a decent amount of crime to even much more dangerous neighborhoods. And you know, that's not because they're part of a criminal element, it's because you know, they're kind of pushed uh, deeper and deeper into the inner city. Landlords that kind of overlook criminal records or overlook certain kind of criminal practices also overlook uh, eviction records. And so you do have you do have a concentration of crime at a, much, at a much more acute level than just the neighborhood. I think there's also a, a policy story here in a different direction, which is about America's experiment with mass incarceration. And you know, in some states, governors literally redirected funds for public housing to build more prison. We've had this enormous expansion of public housing in America. It's just been with cages. And so, you know, and that's not a rhetorical thing. Like, that's a thing that actually, that was an actual policy decision, which reflects a, a deeper normative decision about, about our, our policies, too. So I think mass incarceration and housing instability and crime and poverty are bound up in a tight knot. So the temptation is to think that this is another extreme story from America, but I want to bring you in now, Campbell, to ask you about the relevance of this book to what's happening in this country, because it's well known that we have a housing crisis and many of the things that Matt's describing are well known to us as well, mass incarceration and the decline of public housing. How relevant is this to what we are going through? Um, well, I, I think the first thing to say is a, it's a great book and, it, and it's, a, it's a story that we try to tell at Shelter every day about actually what the true consequence of homelessness is and eviction. Uh, it is uh, by far and away one of the most significant and traumatic events that you can go through. Children and, as you say, mothers and families that are put through this take a huge time to recover. It is a loss of the, one of the most primal things that you can have as a home. And I think what the book tells is a story that we forget uh, uh, a lot in public policy and the discussions about homelessness, the real, real consequence for people at, at what it is. And I think that's what's very strong about it. So the first thing is I think there's a real resonance there. Uh, we see every day people literally uh, making choices between paying their rent and paying their uh, heating bills or feeding their children because they want, they, the thing that we see, people try so hard to stay in their home. They make the most terrible choices so they can keep a roof over their head. So to lose that and to keep losing it, uh, it's just, a, a, as you say, there's something in people's soul that gets lost, and, and to get that back is just a huge thing. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing, there's an interesting, uh, and uh, you, in the book it's compared quite favourably with, uh, with the system we have in the UK, and I'd say that's sadly now becoming a historical perspective as opposed to a, a, a perspective for now. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about um, the post-war settlement in Britain was that there were three elements to beverages, uh, welfare state, uh, comprehensive education system, uh, an NHS uh, free at the point of delivery, and decent homes for all. 
And over the last 50 years in public policy in Britain, we've seen two of those mostly maintained as a political consensus, health and education, but housing becoming effectively uh, the sole preserve of the market. And that's, it, it, that has happened even quicker, and I suspect much more like America in the last 10 years than it has in the previous uh, 40. And I guess the contrast that I would make with the book, just to kind of help with the discussion, is that it points to housing benefit. And housing benefit, uh, and it's a very interesting point where we're reaching, uh, where we wrote, reached uh, in about the 70s, where Britain had for uh, a long time invested in bricks. We built houses, successive Conservative Labour governments fought over how many homes they could build. Macmillan uh, actually built more as a Conservative Prime Minister than any other uh, kind of leader in the last uh, uh, century. Uh, and then we decided oh, we have enough homes so what we'll just do is we'll use public policy and public funds just to top people up a little bit uh, through housing benefit. Uh, this is in the 70s uh, and that'll be okay because we've got enough homes. And then over the last 40, 25, 30 years, we've seen the housing benefit bill rocket because we've not invested in the bricks uh, and we've invested in the benefits. Uh, and that's where we've got to now. And it's the only challenge that for us in terms of your solutions is that we would absolutely passionately believe you have to, have to fix the supply problem and, not, and benefits isn't the answer. It has to be right now because you can't let people and what the government is doing in terms of uh, uh, it cuts to, uh, to benefits and the local housing allowance is terrible and that's why we need even more buying. The other areas which I really think we should draw out, which I really like in the book, is the, the lack of legal rights. Uh, it's an absolute disgrace that people can be evicted in, in the way that they are in America. But with the cuts to uh, legal aid we've seen in the last uh, uh, five or six years, uh, there are vice deserts, there are legal deserts in Britain. Mm. And we have a form of, in, particularly in the private rented sector, with Section 21 evictions, which is even if you've been paying your rent and you've been in your house for six months, your landlord can evict you. So we do are seeing a growth in the type of evictions, not on the same scale and not in that, that way, that terrible way where your stuff gets dumped in the street, which you described so powerfully. But there is a case in Britain where that is getting worse and it could get much worse. Uh, and then the other part is, is we have a homelessness legislation framework which exists mostly since 1977 in shelter. We claim credit for, for driving that in the 60s and 70s. That is also under threat. Uh, and that is hugely under threat, and that's seen around the world as one of the most powerful and important pieces of legislation which, for the first time in, in the world, defined homelessness, not just as ruthlessness. And that is again under threat, and we have to be very careful. So my analysis would be that this is, uh, the book tells the story so powerfully of what we see every day at Shelter, of the truly, truly terrible consequences for everybody, both in a family and in a neighbourhood and in a community of homelessness. Uh, and the power and importance of public policy of stopping that. Second thing is that I'd love to be able to say that we are better, uh, but I would say that uh, certainly over the last five or six years and moving forward, the system of protection against homelessness that we have in the country that you, you describe is absolutely an under threat at the moment. And if we don't uh, protect that and make the case for it, then there is a real danger that we could end up in a very similar situation that you have mm. in America. We're not there yet, but I definitely think that we can move to that place. Think, Matt, you were telling me that we had the highest a record number of evictions in the UK last year, the highest number yeah. on record. I want to ask you about this kind of structural push towards homelessness of the fact that these families are basically constantly in arrears because they spend 70-80% of their income on rent. How frequently do you see that at Shelter? The one advantage that we still have in terms of generally speaking housing benefit, but that is changing uh, as we go forward at the moment, most people in that type of situation would get some form of help. It wouldn't go all the way, and even more so now, it won't go all the way to paying their rent. But at the worst cases, we see people paying 45, 50, 60 percent of their rent. So we don't quite see the, the 70, 80 percent. But what we see at Shelter every time is, as you described in the book, selling food stamps. It's the same kind of thing. Do I buy my uh, child a new uniform, or do I pay the rent? Do I pay my water bill this week, month and my rent the next month? People are constantly in debt, and that constant debt is just terrifying and exhausting and just a drain on people's resources. They're constantly having to make those terrible choices. And that's what we see. And one of the things that we've not seen, fortunately, so far in this recession, which would have made the UK far worse, is interest rates staying low. Because you know, what we see is mostly people uh, in both in uh, their own homes and mostly in private and, and social rented struggling with that. If we saw interest rates go up, we'd see a lot of people who have overborrowed to own their own home being in the same situation. So it's a really, really difficult issue. So this is a story not just of homelessness, it's a story of debt. And it's about, and the other thing, and this is different again in America, which from, a, from your book, a lot of the people that we work with are working. 
This is a story of working poor in Britain as well. Zero-hour zero contracts is about people who don't know uh, when their next job or what their next day is coming from. No pension, no savings. For people in the private rented sector in London but across, they have to get uh, probably a deposit of five or six hundred pounds, a rent, sometimes two, rent, two months rent up free of five or six hundred pounds, a letting agent fee uh, of a couple or two hundred, three hundred pounds, sometimes a finder's fee because there's lots of people looking for the property. That's four or five thousand pounds for somebody who's working a minimum wage or sometimes below. Uh, and that's just not achievable. So any savings, any money they have is, is tied up in that kind of thing. So this is terribly, terribly difficult. So it is working. The difference that you don't tend to have is as we see in, uh, in Britain and increasingly so in the private rented sector. It's people who are working who are struggling as well. It's so current, isn't it? Because we had the budget last week and one of the first people I interviewed when the budget was announced was obviously people affected by the cuts to disability allowance, but also a landlady who, she's not Sharina in the sense that she's not a slam land, slum landlord with dozens of properties, but she has about 10 properties in a low income area. And she said that the changes in the budget which penalize private landlords are going to immediately force her to push rent up for low income people because she's lost some of the tax benefits um, well, I think for, she has a choice. She can, over. Re, she can reduce her profit margin. Obviously, uh, this is her uh, so not, uh, But she, she made a compelling case of somebody whose profit margin is quite small once yeah. she's paid off a mortgage, and that the, 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 the profit after she paid off a mortgage, which previously wouldn't have been taxed, is now going to be taxed, and that would inevitably be passed on to tenants. Well, I just want to bring, I, I mean, we can, we can, oh, we can, can I just make the case yeah. because that absolutely makes the case. It's, it's true. And the lot, and we do need to, it's a, the story you tell us, Shireen, is, is a complicated one that we have with the relationship with private sector landlords here in Britain as well. Uh, at Shelter, we, and we work in inner cities all across England and Scotland. And every day when we're trying to find people who are literally homeless, find them somewhere to live, there is no social housing for them where we used to be able to put someone in dire need. We have to look to the private rental sector. When we look to the private rental sector, the only people that are going to take people on benefits or who have uh, a criminal conviction are, are landlords who operate in this area, who operate at the margins of what we would call, you know, sort of, we sometimes at the far end are called rogue landlords, but they are operating in this margin. And, and at that absolutely makes the case for building more public housing, what we call social housing, because if we have that, with that lack of that not being available, we don't have that security of tenure and that place where we can, people who are really vulnerable, I mean so vulnerable when they've just been evicted, and then you put them into somewhere where they're at the whim of another landlord who can evict them or put the rent up at any time. What chance do people have to get recovery? Sorry, I didn't, I, I'm sorry, Owen. Yeah, sure I, well, I, I promise. I, 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 it feels like a natural moment to bring you in. This is a time of policy change in the direction of people, low income people moving out of public housing into the private rental sector and also a time of cuts to benefits. And I guess one of the structural issues in the book is the fact that demand for affordable housing so massively outstrips supply that it's a landlord's game. They can get away with murder almost. What, what's your perspective on the current political situation and, and how is it going to affect Britain's equivalent of the characters in, in this book? Well, well first, it's an honour to be here. It's a great book, really compelling book, uh, full of humanity, which actually, I'll explain, I think is politically very important mm. in terms of actually winning the case and winning the argument. Um, and uh, we've already spoken what's in common. I mean, the, the problems often differ in specifics and scale, but there's a huge amount, of course, in common from deindustrialisation to the decline of public housing, uh, cuts to social security and so-called reform of social security. Um, and of, of societies, quite frankly, uh, which all too often are run uh, around the principle not of people's needs, but, but profit, uh, where housing is an asset, not a basic right uh, to sustain people's existence, both for them and their family. Now, in, in terms of Britain, I mean, in terms of the political situation there, I suppose, I mean, I, I think what's heartening to a degree, maybe you disagree on this, but housing, I mean, it's languished down the political yeah, no, it's, agenda. It's coming up. It's but it is coming up, and it's coming up for very obvious reasons, which is uh, the needs are, are, are increasing. It's, it's becoming less of a peripheral issue, often affecting those who are less likely to vote, uh, therefore can be more ignored by politicians, quite frankly. Um, and that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, the crisis of, of council housing, where there are now five million people languishing on social housing waiting lists in this country, denied a basic right, a basic need, an affordable, genuinely affordable 
home, not affordable as Boris Johnson defines it, which is 80% of market rents, which is a very Orwellian use of the word uh, affordable, but genuine, decent, comfortable homes to support people and their families. That's, of course, in this country because of uh, the failure to replace stocks sold off through right to buy uh, in the 1980s. Uh, the point of that policy originally was to create a home, a property owning democracy. Well, home ownership peaked in 2003, yeah. 2004. It's back now to the levels in the 1980s, and a huge chunk of those homes sold off are now, of course, run by buy to let um, landlords, not owned by, by individuals themselves. And, uh, you know, this, because of that, millions of people, because home ownership particularly is declining amongst those under 34, they're under. This government, the party of home ownership, it's, uh, there are 250,000 fewer homeowners than when David Cameron came to power. So people are dragged into the, the private rented sector, uh, where you, it's often, I mean, it's very unregulated compared to other countries, uh, and where rents are simply unaffordable. And the vast majority of new claimants of housing benefit in recent years have been people in work whose wages are too low and rents are too high. And now one in four London households are claiming housing benefit. Uh, which is remarkable, and that's because of that failure to build. Um, and, you know, if you look at London, I mean, I'm a, I'm a plastic northern, I've sold out my, uh, my northern roots, but, <laughs> you know, I love this city, uh, and it's a, it's, it's a great city in, in, in just so many ways. You know, people come from Sri Lanka, Sudan, Stockport. But the thing is, <laughs> you know, the thing is about this city is, is you get, you know, these new build properties built in the centre of London, which are just left vacant often, whilst one in four young people grow up in an overcrowded home. And we know the consequences. You know, every study from, you know, in terms of health, education and well-being, the human consequences which you uh, so eloquently spoke about. And, and the reality is now, particularly for those under 34 but others, they, they don't have a chance. They're often growing up in overcrowded homes increasingly. Uh, they can't get a council house when they come of a certain age because... You know, the, the original dream of council housing was to support mixed communities. Nye Bevan, who founded our National Health Service, when he launched the council house building programme, he said he wanted to create mixed communities, uh, which he said would recreate the lovely features of the English and Welsh village where the doctor and the butcher would live next door to one another. Well, increasingly, housing is, of course, uh, ghettoised because social housing is now increasingly confined to, to those often who are struggling the most and where we ghettoise uh, those who are struggling most problematic uh, circumstances. So they're, dri they're driven into a private rented sector with a lack of security and wages they can't afford and they can't have the prospect of home ownership and that I think is what's driving this up the, ho up, up the political agenda because even if you're a parent who owns your own home your kid isn't in a situation where they can afford to do that and you're not in a financial situation to allow them to do that either. So even if you're not directly affected, more and more parents are seeing their children denied that right. And that's what's driving all the political agenda. But just finally on that point about stories, it's a really important point because I've just hypocritically bombarded people with statistics. But, uh, you know, George Lakoff, an American political uh, linguist, makes the point the right uh, of politics often use stories, whilst the left will use often facts and statistics. But we're not robots, we're not machines, we're human beings. And we think in terms of, of stories, you know, and, and that's why when it comes to, say, benefit fraud, on average, people think it's about 27%, and, and it's actually, according to the government, 0.7% their statistics. And, and that's not because people have been told over and over again that 27% is lost to benefit fraud. It's because they've constantly been bombarded with often quite extreme stories of people playing the system with 20 kids and mansions made out of widescreen television sets. And, and, and they're bombarded with that, so they think it's far higher than than it actually is. And mm. people like me, then, you get the front of the Daily Mail or The Sun, you know, 20 kids, widescreen television sets, and, uh, you know, we have this smart-ass response. Well, actually, benefit for is only 0.7% of Social Security spending. It doesn't work. You know, we've got to use the sorts mm. of stories that you so brilliantly have used in that book because that connects with people mm. emotionally and everything from the refugee crisis to Social Security, what makes a big difference with attitudes is the real human stories and what people are actually experiencing rather than what I've hypocritically done, which has gone on about statistics. <laughs> I want to, there's the, there's the human suffering and the, the stories. There's also the social issue of segregation, ghettoization. That's such a strong theme of kind of sub theme that continues as a current throughout the book. 
And it strikes me, this is something that we talk about here, it's often said that the changes in housing benefit will strip inner city London and other cities of working class people that they're being pushed out. I want to ask you, Matt, what you think the kind of social impact of this level of segregation is. And I want to ask the other two um, whether you think that is happening here and, and whether it is something that we should be talking about more, the long term impact. I mean, you first, Matt. It's so striking to me. I know yeah. America is kind of used to a level of segregation yeah. that we're not used to, but it's, it's so yeah. extreme. There is a separate ghetto for white people, Latino people and yeah. African-American people yeah. in Milwaukee. That's right. And the, the land kind of like the social geography and the physical geography like really dance together really well in Milwaukee. So there's a valley in the middle called the Menominee River Valley, and there's only a few bridges over that uh, valley. And that usually, that was what traditionally separated the historically African-American neighborhoods from the historically white neighborhoods, which were Polish. And there was an old joke in Milwaukee that, you know, the 16th Street Viaduct Bridge is the longest bridge in the world because it connected Africa to Poland. And it's, it's still kind of like that. It's still kind of like that. You know, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in the country, uh, but there's a lot of segregation in Milwaukee. And what we know from research is that African-American poverty and white poverty are qualitatively not the same thing because poor white folks and poor black folks live in just vastly different neighborhoods. You know, poor black folks are living in neighborhoods with much higher crime, much lower property values, schools are much worse. It's been neighborhoods that have been completely abandoned by industry and abandoned by the state. And um, that really has huge effects independent of your individual poverty. And like, we all know this, we all know that neighborhoods matter. We all try to live in neighborhoods that are safe and that have good schools for our kids. And a lot of African-American folks aren't offered that opportunity. And if you survey Americans, most Americans think that our cities are so segregated because of personal choice. And personal choice has a role to play, but there's way more research on the, the role of like acute uh, racial discrimination in our housing market. So if we go back to Bennett and Crystal, there's a moment where they are two African-American women, they're looking for housing, and uh, they were looking on the south side of Milwaukee, which is the Hispanic area. And uh, Bennett has like three young kids, and this, this place didn't have a tub. And you gotta have a tub if you have kids. And so she asked the landlord, well, do you have a tub? And the landlord was like, well, I have a tub. tub. you mean bath. Yeah, bath, yeah. Yeah, yeah British, just, yeah. just wanted to In any time that's necessary, please. <laughs> Um, a bath. And so, uh, and I'm, at the, I'm in the car watching men at his kids at the time. And then I'll say, yeah, I have a nicer place, it's bigger, it's the same rent. And then he kind of stops himself and he, you know, answers the phone and he, you know, he, he has a fake conversation with someone and then he hangs up and is like, golly gee, um, I just, we just rented it out. And so I wrote down his number and like, uh, I called him up the next day. I'm a white guy. And uh, I told him I had the exact same income that those two women did together, that I had three kids. They showed me the place and I was like, do you have a place with a bath? Uh, and, and he's like, sure. And he drove me to it uh, in his sob. And, uh, and then I turned him into the Fair Housing Council. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, that's one antidote. But we have statistical studies that happens over and over and over again. And when you follow evicted families, from their homes, which are literally the most vulnerable renters in the city, what you find is that white evicted families will not even consider African-American neighborhoods. And African-American evicted families start their housing search by looking outside of those neighborhoods. To the extent that folks can, they're actively trying to move their kids into safer and better neighborhoods. They just get pushed deeper and deeper into the inner city because of the eviction record, because of the salience of racial discrimination. I mean, one thing that we've had in London, and you referred to Bevan, is mixed communities. You know, we all in London are familiar with areas where you'll have a council state next to an affluent area of expensive housing. Is that going to change? Are we going to see more segregation along class and race in this country? And how worried are you about that, Owen, and Owen first? Undoubtedly. I mean, London's been quite different uh, traditionally to, say, Paris, where you'll get the affluent living in the middle and then you have the so-called bonlier, the suburbs where uh, poorer people are, are segregated and, and ghettoised with pretty disastrous consequences, um, which we've seen. And, and London's uh, been better, at, better in terms of mixing people from different backgrounds. We do have segregation partly in terms of race nowhere near on the scale of the United States. 
uh, because London has amongst the highest level of mixed race relationships on earth. Mm. So th there is that mixing taking place. Uh, and, and if you go to places like Hackney and, and Tower Hamlets and Newham, you get people from different communities who still, who still very much live and work together and, and go to school together and have families together. Um, but undoubtedly in the last few years, because of uh, cuts to housing benefit, to social security, uh, because of the failure to build uh, council housing, because now it's becoming so residualised, uh, increasingly turned into a temporary transit camp, basically for those in the most problematic circumstances, because of rents which are unaffordable uh, and increasing, uh, we've seen a, huge, a quite dramatic and growing shift of lower income people from those uh, from inner London to not just outer London, but increasingly dispersed across the country as well. And that's frightening, of course it is, because I think we, you know, I'm not going to glamorise it. People can live in the same community and live parallel lives. They might live around the corner. It doesn't mean they're necessarily mixing together in the way people might like. But nonetheless, there's no question, you know, you're ending up with a situation where you're going to have cleaners coming in on night buses to clean the homes of people who, you know, maybe earn in a, in a, in a day what they might earn in a year. And, and they're being driven, you know, they have to go night bus 4 a.m. in the morning living far away from, from where they work. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible, you know, where inner London will become playground for the affluent and for the rich. And, uh, and that's going to get far worse because of everything from the new policies on, on housing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, basically abolishing uh, council housing as we know it in terms of flogging off uh, local, uh, sorry, in terms of housing association, um, housing, flogging off so-called, uh, you know, using expensive so-called council housing uh, to flog that off and, 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 and you'll, you'll end up breaking up those mixed communities even further. I think uh, mm. I, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. I think, and just by the way, if you ever moved to Britain and want a job, shelter's your place. That's a great story, by the way. Uh, uh, that's fine. We turn people in like that all the time. Uh, uh, that's great. I think the other story, which is absolutely is, this isn't just a story about London. Uh, if we go up, uh, if you, you know, ever make it back up north home, uh, you know, you, you, they are really <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're the one who said, uh, I, I know, I, was, I, saw, I follow you on Twitter, I see you fight, fight, fighting people all the time. But what uh, the point is, is, this is a failure of economic policy in Britain that goes back decades. We have uh, loads and loads of jobs uh, and no houses in some places and no jobs and loads of houses in other places uh, and that is a huge and a, a huge problem we have uh, and so building a couple of fast link railways isn't going to be the thing that solves that problem and it's a start in trying to get things getting people around the country better but london become is becoming and boris johnson he went up to scotland and said he wanted you know edinburgh to be effectively an economic suburb of london london should be the mega city which kind of draws in all the things if you allow that to happen then this situation will get worse the, my example which is a kind of is a true one in we don't lack land or places to build in surrey there is more land used uh, for golf courses than there is for human habitation hmm. uh, we have choices in public policy we have choices to make and the what is happening and the other th side of this story is that just to finish ghettoization and, and, and it is happening, but it's happening in an incredibly awful way, which is now in London particularly, you can be told if you present as homeless, and this happens regularly, you can be told, yes, we can give you a home, but you have to go to Birmingham, or you have to go to Yarmouth, or you have to go, you, we can go for your home, but we're not going to offer you a home in London, in the place where you grew up, where your family is, maybe where your children are at school, and where you might have a prospect of a job. So we are now got public policy which drives people away and the political response to that, particularly from the right, is that, well, uh, you know, my children can't afford to live in London or, you know, that, that's what happens. The city's being successful. We cannot allow that to become the public policy of choice. We have to fight for mixed communities, for economics that actually drives people together, because otherwise we will end up with Milwaukee's uh, or even more Milwaukee's and London. London is just different, uh, but it's a, a, an exaggerated microcosm of what's happening around the country. I'd like to open it up for questions now. We've got about 15 minutes. I can already see some hands up. So um, we'll take, can you manage if I take two or three at a time? Um, we'll, take, we'll try and take two or three questions at a time. And I'd like to try and get as many of you in. So if you could keep your questions short, I'd be really grateful. Um, yep, so we have um, a gentleman here in the front with the glasses and the gentleman behind there. And I'll come to you next. 
Hi, I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about the problems of low-income owner occupiers. Uh, we, you focus a lot on the problems of renters in your book, but I just wonder what your take is on the uh, foreclosure issues that faced people who had subprime mortgages, and to some extent, you know, also in terms of policy in the UK, uh, whether also there's similar issues that possibly are around the corner on that, because it's obviously, in terms of numbers, probably a bigger problem for the number of people who are evicted. Do you want to take a few? Yes, sorry, yes. Um, yes, I said, uh, sorry, I said this gentleman in the black top next. I'll take you <coughs> next time. Um, my question would be that if you, if each of you were the Prime Minister, what would you specifically do to, do to deal with, like, the ghettoization with um, housing? Is that to um, Owen and That's Campbell? And Campbell? I don't think yeah. I can be the Prime Minister. <laughs> well, you can be well, president. You never know. You can be president for being years. Vacancy, yeah. Okay. Well, it's most specifically to Owen, but you can answer it as well. Thank you. And I'll take <laughs> this lady in the grey top as well. I'll take you next time. I haven't seen you. Hi, I, I was just wondering that as an ethnographer, how did you develop relationships with the families whose lives you documented? And what, what were some of the challenges you faced while you know, watching evictions happen right in front of you? I'm glad you asked that because I really want to know the answer as well. Thank you very much. Good questions. Um, so you take yours first, Matt. So the subprime mortgage crisis was an enormous shock to the global economy and a shock to low-income families, but it's not bigger than the eviction epidemic. Evictions happened in large numbers before the subprime collapse. They're happening in large numbers after the subprime collapse. A story that a lot of the American media at least didn't pick up was many foreclosures happened to landlords. So in Los Angeles, for example, one out of two foreclosures at the height of the crisis was a landlord losing that property. I think who lost it is the small mom and pop landlords, and I think who picked it up is the larger landlords that had enough capital to take advantage of an opportunity to buy below market rent and rent at market rent uh, during an insolvency crisis with the banks. And if that happened at scale, that means our property is becoming consolidated in fewer and fewer hands. The book is about low-income families. It's about poverty in America, and most low-income families are renters in the U.S. So it focuses on an, an older story, although subprime crisis is obviously incredibly important. Uh, I can't be prime minister, but the book kind of argues that we have to ask a question of ourselves, at least in America, which is, do we believe that housing is a fundamental right? And I think we have to say yes to that question because it's fundamental, it's central to human flourishing and economic mobility. And we in America can deliver on that right. We already have a universal housing program in the United States. It's just for rich and middle class people in the form of uh, tax breaks for homeowners. And so we just need to be honest about that as a nation and kind of revisit that. And I think that there is a time for reform and kind of a way to ask ourselves in the year that Arlene got evicted uh, for, in, the, in the dead of winter in Milwaukee, you know, America spent about $171 billion on tax break for its homeowners and only about $40 billion on direct housing assistance to the needy. I think we need to have a real conversation of is that fair? And if we come down on no, uh, then I think we, there's all sorts of things we can do. But one thing is certain, like this level of inequality and this like, level of social suffering that we've tolerated in my country um, is not justified by any American value or piece of scripture or ethical teaching. So, thank, thanks, thank you. So, moving in neighborhoods helped a lot. So, I moved into a trailer park and I lived there for five months. This is Tobin's trailer park. Tobin tra tra there. Tobin's trailer park, yeah. And uh, most of the time I didn't have hot water, even though I told the landlord, like, I'm a writer, I'm going to write about you and your trailer park. <laughs> and so, so, imagine what my neighbors had to go through. And then I, I, then I rented a room, a very small room in a rooming house in the inner city of Milwaukee, and I lived there for about 10 months. And from those two neighborhoods, met families going through the eviction and landlords doing the evicting, and generally just tried to like hang out with them as much as I could. So I not only went to housing court with them and followed them to shelters and abandoned homes, I also like slept on their couches and ate from their dinner tables and watched their kids. They bought me gifts, I bought them gifts, I went to funerals with people and AA meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and church with people, and was even there for a birth. And, uh, and I think that that level of depth and that level of intimacy uh, really helped me write about not only people's experiences, but try to, trying to capture their essence, like who they are as, as people. Amazing amount. Of, I think the amount of uh, investment you put in time shows in the book, because one thing you get when you read this book is how does he know 
what's going on in their head, you know, that you got to know these people individually yeah. over a long period. Yeah. So Owen and Campbell uh, running for Prime Minister. Well, not <laughs> not that much no. of a stretch for some <laughs> people on the panel. Oh, yeah. Right, what would you do? It's the, it's the question, what would you do? Oh, yeah. Blimey. Well, fortunately, things aren't that desperate. Um, <laughs> I think uh, a number of things. I think, firstly, in terms of a council house building programme, um, whereby, because, you know, I mean, as you say, the Labour and the Conservatives in the 1950s competed over how many council houses they could build. The problem in the 1950s, of course, is the Conservatives scrimped on quality yeah. and on size. The original vision of council housing was that it was a, of a better standard yeah. than private housing that existed at the time, which is obviously what we should aspire to today. And one of the things we should be doing is giving councils the power to borrow to build. Um, and in doing so, those councils will get a secure stream of rent. Um, by having a house building programme, because obviously in the aftermath of World War II, we had a worse deficit and debt problem to deal with in this country, but it was good for the economy as well, and because you create jobs, skilled jobs, particularly for young people, it has a multiplier effect in the economy because you don't just help construction, you, you, you help stimulate all the industries dependent on construction as well. You'll bring down the housing benefit bill because this housing benefit bill is a, is a symptom of the failure to build and often subsidises private landlords charging rents people simply cannot afford um, in this country. Uh, so I think the count, a radical council house building programme, good, decent quality council housing, it's, I know it's problematic because it's been so stigmatised um, in this country and residualised, but decent quality housing. As well as that, I'd, I'd regulate the private rented sector uh, based on the models in other countries like uh, Germany, for example, uh, where you have secure tenancies because one of the problems... I mean, in Germany, you have a society where it's normal to rent in a way it's often stigmatised, even though it's more common, increasingly becoming more common, sorry, in this country. Uh, but you have secure tenancy agreements, so people can settle down and have families, because more and more now, you've got families driven into a private rented sector, they could get booted out with very short notice, their kids bump from school to school, unable to set down roots in their community. So I'd do that uh, and regulate the rents, not, not in an arbitrary way, capped way, but in the way they do in places like Germany. And equally, I'd look at things like council tax. I think it's a regressive tax, which hits low-income and middle-income people. I'm interested in a land value tax, where you tax according to the values of property, and I think that could help low-income and middle-income people. So, yeah, there's lots of things. Um, yeah, there's a good start. Okay. <laughs> so, basically, I vote for Owen. Because uh, uh, that was all the things I was going to say. So, I'll answer. Uh, uh, and given that we're actually in a, in a period where it appears that we can just uh, stop things happening in budgets, I would get rid of that. To pay for all of that, I would get rid of the increase in uh, or the decrease in tax for the top rate uh, taxpayer uh, and pay for all of that immediately uh, by, with that tax break. For, uh, but I'll answer your question. We are actually have a public policy at the moment uh, which is actually storing up significant problems for the future. We have historically low interest rates, which people, uh, you know, young people can't believe that actually, you know, even 10 years ago, interest rates were 7% and 20 years ago, they were 20, 15, 16%. Um, and we have a set of policies from this government right to buy right through which is encouraging young people to, to take cheap money at the moment uh, to take long-term mortgages uh, on, a, on a basis that really if uh, we see any change in the economy or any growth in interest rates is going to put a whole bunch of uh, low-income homeowners in very very significant problems and then we'll be back in a public policy problem that we had in the 90s uh, when the last time housing was important because lots and lots of middle-class people were being evicted in Britain and suddenly we saw political interest in it then so uh, there is a there is a public policy story that's going to come again in five or ten years when that happens. Thank you. Right, gentlemen here, um, and then, oh gosh, there's so many questions. I'm not going to get to everybody yet. Gentlemen here, and I'll take you, and hopefully we'll have time for one more round. Anyone we don't get to, it's not personal. I have, <laughs> I have been huh. accused of, of making personal selections. People get upset. I'm going to try to get to all of you. Okay. Uh, yes, you right. first. Thank you very much for your talk, and thank you for your description of poverty. We can add that to the pile of what we've had for the last 300 years of description of poverty. How have we had free speakers talk about poverty and not once mentioned capitalism? And how capitalism dominates the economic force of this world? I find that quite disturbing that these banks and capitalism have inflicted terrible economic rape upon the people. And yet you've not brought this up once. How are you not just as guilty? 
of inflicting poverty on the world when you're not facing the real problem, which is 63, uh, 64 people now own almost in excess of half the world's wealth. How are you not guilty? Okay, I think we Thank you. That. Thank you. Uh, I said the gentleman here in the grey jumper. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, when they brought in the bedroom tax, when I first heard it, I thought, what a great idea because I totally misunderstood it. I thought it was going to be a tax on all of the empty bedrooms in the private yeah. sector. <laughs> and if a, we did something like that, idea. one, we'd raise a heck of a lot of money, and two, it would encourage people not to have empty bedrooms. So we have resources that we're not using, but one of the problems that we have, and I believe it would be quite easy to fix, is that if you have a mortgage, the way the rules are set up at the moment, if you rent out a room, the renter has more rights than your family members do. Therefore, it's, you need permission from your lender in order to, to let out a room. If that would seem like a really easy change, I know it's not going to fix particularly for families, but for single people, it really will help. And it will help people pay their mortgages. I mean, it just seems there are some really easy things that we don't need Owen to become prime minister in order to fix. <laughs> That's a relief. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, no, is the gentleman here with the laptop <laughs> I said next? Um, I just wanted to ask, Matthew, in your, um, in your explorations, did you find any evidence of kind of rental organising or kind of, or what's your opinion on sort of cooperative, um, cooperative housing models to, to stem this and kind of tackle the market? Thank you very much. More great questions. Matt. I'm going to try to take the first and the third question together, leave you guys talking about the bedroom tax. <laughs> I think that um, there are many different kinds of capitalism. There's high road capitalism and there's low road capitalism. And um, I think that when we think about these issues, I think one thing that I always ask myself is like, um, who are we accountable to in our work? And um, I always felt that I was very accountable to the people I wrote in the book. And I thought that it was my responsibility to propose a solution to the affordable housing crisis that's big, that's bold, that would make a huge difference, but that also accepts our current state of affairs. And I think what I propose at the end of Evicted is a universal housing voucher program that does work with the private market, that does have certain kind of regulations, that does bring landlords and tenants to the table. I think that's something that could have broad bipartisan support and utterly change the face of poverty in America. And it's something that's doable and actually practical. And I think this gets to your point about alternative forms of ownership and these kind of things. And when you go around the country, you, you see like all see these amazing things that are happening. You know, Baltimore is reclaiming vacant plots and like refurbishing them and selling them at, you know, cost to low income families. Uh, Texas has had amazing luck with um, uh, land grants and, and providing home ownership to low-income families. I was on a panel the other day with a housing activist and she was talking a lot about decommodification of the land and anti-capitalism, these alternative modes. And she worked like really, really hard for months and months and months and she got to house like four people. And like, we're just bleeding, we're bleeding out. We're bleeding out in America. And we have to do something at scale that's efficient and that like works with like the hand we've been dealt and like that's why that a voucher program is the best way to do that i think and then if we get there maybe we can have conversations about next steps that's where i come down Aaron? uh capitalism yeah i'm always accused of being soft on capitalism <laughs> i mean why do you love capitalism so much Owen? I mean, that's what they say um yeah i mean what i said obviously at the, the the beginning of my contribution is that the problem we have our society is based around the interests of profit yeah. rather than social need. Um, and that's a point I will return to, obviously. And, you know, I just think, you know, with terms like that, capitalism, I think those of us who want to change the world just have to make a decision, which is, do we want to make a point or do we want to win people over? And my experience just happens to be, maybe it's different from yours, is that when words like that are bandied around, people tend to glaze over and it doesn't connect to the way they speak about the world around them. Well, I mean, we could say that about cat. I mean, I, I, is, it, is, it, is it a failure to say that we have a society based around profit rather than social need instead of using the technical, a technical term like capitalism? 
I suppose we just disagree. And what I'm interested in is, is winning people over and talking to them. And there is a long tradition in this country, a kind of people's front of Judea tradition, where people are, who want to change the world and are very angry and passionate about doing so are very good at talking to themselves. And they use terms and lingo and language which only they themselves can properly comprehend. And, and to be honest, it's, you won't like this. I use austerity. I bandied that word around for years and years and years. Do you know what the most commonly Googled phrase was during the general election, during the leaders' debate last year? What is austerity? Because people like me bandy that word around, and that is not how people out there talk. That's how, not how they speak about the world around them. And we have to have a way of communicating. And I'm being self-critical here because I've failed. I haven't spoken in a way that I'd like uh, that can reach people because all too often I'm speaking in a way that I understand uh, because I often speak to other people who equally want to change the world and we, we have our own language and culture. But, you know, there's a party in Spain called Podemos, a new party, who uh, want to oppose the sorts of cuts being imposed on Spanish society. And their leader put it very well. He said... The thing is about other Spaniards is they don't cry at the same songs that I do. Hmm. And the point he was making is that there's things that he understands and that a culture and world he was brought up in, but that's not how other people think. And I will unapologetically keep on as best I can and I will fail along the way to try and communicate ideas that challenge the way things are in a way that doesn't make people glaze over and doesn't divorce what I'm trying to argue from their everyday lives and reality. I agree with that. Entirely. Um, they're running out of time. I'm going so to say one thing, and I'm going to try and answer all three questions. Okay, I promise. <laughs> Part of the problem is, is, is exactly as Owen says, but it, it, particularly with uh, Evicted and what it tells us, what is absolutely wrong about, certainly in this country, what we've done, is we've turned a home into a financial asset. It isn't a financial asset. It is something where people live and grow and thrive and cry and fight uh, and have a life. And as we forget that in public policy and we turn it into an asset that's something that you hold on as your pension, that is why public policy fails in this area. And that can be because of capitalism or whatever it is. But until we turn that around and understand that, then we won't make a difference that we need to make. Sorry, that was as quick as I could make it. And quickly, can you address this? gentleman's question about collectives yes absolutely what we have a the massive problem we have and it's partly of your issues is we have a massive monopoly in this country a, a, a real genuine monopoly about who builds homes in this country we have four or five uh, private sector companies who are the only people that build they have built ever since the second world war about 160, 170,000 homes that are the lowest episode we need about 250,000 homes Private sector is never going to, and why would they? They're never going to build enough homes to meet demand because then price will go down. That's my economics 101, my capitalism 101. That's what happens. So you need the state to involve, you need to either to do it through vouchers, you need to take on land, or you need to invest in actually building houses. When you do that, and then, then you can turn a home into something that actually is aspirational and people want, not something that's just a financial asset. Bedrooms. Absolutely. Uh, it would take a hugely politically brave uh, government to actually not tax poor people and tax rich people uh, for the, the assets they have. But that's actually part of the problem is that I was talking about before. We have a, a, we have a housing stock in Britain which is not fit for purpose. We have lots of older people who are sitting on an asset with three bedrooms, their children have left. They're desperate to move out, but it's their pension. It's their everything that they have. They put all their money into it. And there isn't, a, 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 there isn't something that makes it. This is a joke. A response, but I get trouble on Twitter when you do this, so please don't tweet this. <laughs> but an, Amer an American, uh, I can't remember, a housing specialist told this great story the problem with the British housing market is that we don't have a Florida. Uh, because what happens is in Florida you have, have purpose-built retirement communities where people can sell their three, four bedroom family houses and move to something smaller that suits born? their needs. Who needs Florida? Yes, needs it's not quite born? as sunny or as big. <laughs> uh, 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 but, but part of the problem is that we have a bunch of people who have homes that aren't fit for purpose. They don't want them. You have loads of young families who want to buy houses, but the market is stacked against them and for those people. So you need to break the system and you break the system by building more houses. You build more houses that are genuinely affordable, not this government has absolutely, there's a more bastardised word in the English language than housing affordability. I do not know what it is at the moment, and we have to stop that. Sorry. That is a good, <laughs> as good a note as any to end it on. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you so much to you. Thank you.
I promised it would be an exceptional panel and it was. Thank you again. Thank you for your brilliant